Well, good morning, Vineyard Church. Uh, what an interesting way to gather. My name is Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here at the Vineyard. We are so glad that you're here with us. I'm actually, I've got my Bible, my coffee, my iPad. I'm actually, I'm actually watching church while I'm doing church with you this morning. Good, mer- good morning to the Shoenigs and to Karina and to everybody else tuning in this morning. It's so great to have you all here with us. I think really the only difference probably between you and me this morning, because this is our living room, is that I had to shower and get ready for the day. And you're probably still in your pajamas. Just a, a little bit of a heads up on what you can expect today. My wife and I are going to be leading the service from our living room. Ironically, 52 weeks ago to the date, we we did this from our living room as we were trying to figure out how to do live stream, you know, and, and when COVID-19 hit and we could no longer gather, we we kind of scrambled. So we just had a chuckle as a staff that exactly one year later with the Colorado blizzard and snowstorm, we're back at it again in the living room. And I'm so glad that we now have the technology where uh, maybe we scrambled to pull this together, but we knew what we were doing a little bit more this time. And I can assure you, that the, the scene you see behind us is probably one of the only clean rooms in the house right now. If I were to take the camera around the corner, you would see what we actually did to prepare for this morning. Um, but we're going to sing a couple songs. I've got a message prepared for you. I invite my wife, Natalie, to come and join us. She's going to lead us in worship this morning. And, you know, if you hear a dog howling in the background, don't worry. Uh, it's our giant schnauzer. If a kid starts screaming. This is just the family (laughs) church life. Uh, We've got Frozen on downstairs, but I don't know how long that's going to last this morning. So, But anyway, we are so glad that you are here with us. A quick little logistical thing. If you're tuning in online um, on an iPad or a device, you can click on the notes. We've actually put the lyrics on there for you because it's hard for us to have all the lyrics on the slides this morning with kind of the way that we're doing it. I also have sermon notes, and there's a there's a button for giving and prayer requests. Of course, are all present and, and active there. If you're on your phone, you can just find all of that at votrweekly.org and kind of switch between devices and stay in touch with us that way as well. But we're excited to do this, and it's so great. We're glad that we have a way to do this. Yeah, <laughs> it's just you know, it's just going to feel a little bit more like a fireside chat this morning than a than a big church production. But man, I love that actually. I love that we're just going to be able to dig into the scriptures together, continue our series, Crazy Things Jesus Said, and and really begin to worship and and hear from God together this morning. Of course, we'll have ministry time before we wrap up as well, which should be really great, uh, because I know our staff is ready to pray with everybody who wants prayer this morning. Let me pray, and then we can just kind of invite the Holy Spirit to, to move among us as we're all in these different houses this morning. God, thank you so much for your presence here with us. And we invite you, we invite you into our home upon Natalie and myself and our children. We invite you upon uh, the hundreds of homes uh, and and folks that are going to be watching this this morning, um, as well as throughout the week on demand. Holy Spirit, would you come and and speak to us and, and move in and through us? We are desperate to worship you and we're desperate to hear from you and we're desperate to have a personal experience and encounter with you this morning. Come, Lord Jesus, and have your way. Amen. Amen.
God, give us an experience of your love. Lord, speak through Jeff. Thank you that we can gather. Amen. 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 Well, as you've already seen once, um, the internet is just a little out of control this morning in our neighborhood. We're not exactly sure what to expect for the rest of this morning, but we're just going to keep uh, rolling this entire time and the internet may come and go. Just hit that refresh button and, and try to stay in touch with us as best as you can. And look, we know this isn't perfect. Um, and it feels like very little has been perfect in the last year. Uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm reading the, the culture, the situations, the, the pandemic, now a blizzard, in the right way. It's just been a tough year. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that we cannot control anything. Uh, but God is always in control. And so we're just going to continue to do this. Uh, I still feel like God wants to speak to us this morning through his word. And so we're just going to continue to have the service here this morning and, and just hang with us as the internet is just kind of hit or miss a little bit this morning. Well, if you missed the opener, my name is Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here at the Vineyard. We are excited to continue our series, Crazy Things, Jesus said in this kind of odd, weird little Sunday, uh, doing online here 52 weeks to the date after we started our live stream because of COVID-19. Now we're here because of this blizzard and excited to preach this morning from the Gospel of Luke, uh, continuing our series, Crazy Things Jesus Said. This morning's title is Fan or Follower. Fan or Follower. Tons of but as Jesus walked through his life, as he led his ministry, he wasn't interested in people that were just fans of what he was doing. He was trying to find the true followers. And so Luke 9 really puts this in perspective. Jesus kind of draws a line in the sand, actually three lines in the sand. And he says, hey, what are you going to be? Are you going to be a fan or are you going to be a follower? Because this is the cost of following me. Luke 9 verses 57 to 62. I'm going to read the whole chunk this morning, and then knowing we don't have slides, I'm going to revisit this a few times this morning as well. Luke 9, 57. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Are you a fan or are you a follower? You heard me say it before, but I want to say it again just clearly as we read the Bible, context is always key. We always get a better understanding of what Jesus is saying when we understand the greater context of what we're looking at. And I don't have time to read all of Luke 9 and Luke 10 this morning. Um, I would encourage you sometime during this week, maybe today during the blizzard, to read all of Luke 9 and all of Luke 10 so you can see this picture coming together. But I do want to give you a quick summary of what we're looking at, the greater context of what we're looking at this morning. At the beginning of Luke 9, Jesus sends out his 12 disciples. He sends them out on a ministry trip to preach the kingdom and to heal the sick. And it was a, a powerful experience for the disciples. Shortly after that, Jesus fed the 5,000, and then Peter, Peter declared Jesus as the Messiah. Just after that, we have this, the transfiguration, which was a beautiful spiritual moment. Right? And, and, and just right after that, the, towards the end of Luke 9, a possessed boy is given complete freedom. Jesus' ministry is skyrocketing at this time. It's growing exponentially. You can just see his ministry gaining momentum. And then in Luke 10, which is right after our text for this morning, Jesus sends out 70 disciples, six times more than what he sent out the first time. And again, they're part of an amazing spiritual adventure where they're healing the sick and preaching the kingdom and setting the captives free. And so this text is sandwiched between these two commissionings, one of the 12 and one of the 70. And right in between that, 
Jesus draws this line in the sand and says, are you going to be a fan or are you going to be a follower? But, but what I want you to grasp is that his ministry is growing exponentially. He's growing in popularity during this time. And, and if we were to take this little moment and apply it to the American church, Jesus just does it differently. I mean, in today's world, in today's church, as the popularity and the influence is increasing, somebody around Jesus in today's world would, would say, hey, Jesus, now is the time for you to start a YouTube channel. Now is the time for you to write your first best-selling book or, or to become insta-famous. You've got all this influence. Let's leverage it even more, right? You've got to start dressing cooler and surround yourself with a really good-looking worship team, right? Like all of the trappings, we gotta, we've got to fill all of these spaces up so that we can maximize this influence. I almost imagine somebody putting their arm around Jesus and saying, at least do me a favor. Whatever you do, like don't share one of your really hard teachings right now. Just share a good, solid message so that everybody comes back next week. Jesus, please don't share a hard message right now. But Jesus just doesn't do it that way. He looks at the crowds. He sees the momentum and the influence growing. And he gives them a, he gives them a hard word, a word about the cost of being a true follower and disciple of Jesus. You know, he didn't, Jesus didn't attend any church growth conferences, right? He would have failed that class because in the moment of his great popularity as it's increasing, he just looks at the crowd and he says, are you sure you wanna follow me? Let me tell you what it's like to follow me. And that's what we're looking at in our scripture for today. And actually he has three interactions with, with three different people back to back to back where he kind of draws a hard line in the sand. And that's what we're gonna look at together this morning. Our first interaction from this text, we learn that following Jesus gets uncomfortable. Following Jesus gets uncomfortable. Chaz did a good job of teaching this idea last week, but Jesus is emphasizing it again in this passage, and so I want to emphasize it again this Sunday. Look at Luke 9, 57 to 58. I'll read it out loud. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. This is kind of like episode one, right? This first interaction of three that I told you about. And someone in this, in this kind of scenario, right, someone approaches Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus kind of looks at the guy and he says, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do that? I mean, you can, you can absolutely follow me, but I just want to be crystal clear about what this means, about what that's going to look like. And notice in the scripture that Jesus didn't say no. He didn't rebuke the guy. He didn't like bring up his past at, on, on all of the ways that somehow he was disqualified. Jesus doesn't do that. He looks at the guy and he says, are you sure? Because following me is hard. In fact, sometimes animals have it better than I do. Foxes have dens, birds have nests. I don't even have anywhere to lay my head. They have a controlled environment to go back home to. They have safety and security in their dens and their nests. But me, I don't even have anywhere to lay my head. Are you sure you still want to come? She has mentioned it last week. It's worth repeating because Jesus repeated it. Will you follow Jesus even when life is uncomfortable? The scripture doesn't tell us that it's always going to be uncomfortable. There are going to be days when your pantry is full of food. There are going to be days when your car is working great. There are going to be days when relationships are strong and you have a place to lay your head. But what about when it gets really hard? Will you still follow Jesus even when it's uncomfortable? That's the first thing that we see in this text. But the dialogue continues. Jesus isn't done yet. He starts back up in verse 59 in kind of episode two and interaction two of this scripture. Verse 59, Jesus said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. First interaction, someone comes to Jesus and says, I will follow you. This time, Jesus actually calls someone out. Jesus is the initiator. And if you were one of the 12 disciples who was literally called by Jesus with this same exact phrase, when Jesus looks at someone and says, come, follow me, it would have been reminiscent of the way that Jesus called him or Peter or James or John. 
It just, I mean, we don't know from the text, but it makes you wonder how serious of an invitation this was, how special of a moment this was, maybe a deep invitation for this person to be part of the early church and change human history for as long as we've known it. But the biggest thing to point out from this interaction isn't the similarity in the calling, but the severity of what it means to follow Jesus. It's not the similarity this time, it's the severity of the calling. In episode two, we learn that following Jesus has no conditions. Following Jesus has no conditions. First, it was this lack of comfort and security, but now we see in the second interaction that following Jesus can have no conditions applied. Jesus invited this guy into something adventurous that would have changed human history forever. And, And what we see is one of the most dreaded responses from this guy. The but first response. Jesus, but first, let me go and do this. I'm telling you, in the last decade of ministry, I have seen this this but first response derail more people in their discipleship journey than I can count. And just a quick side note in case you're wondering if this is like a really bizarre request, almost every scholar agrees that this guy's dad wasn't actually dead because in Hebrew culture, it was customary for you to be buried on the same day that you died. So really a more modern translation, when you look at the cultural context and the cultural understanding of what we're reading, it's more like this guy is saying, hey, my dad is aging. I need to go home first. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I need to get my life in order. I need to get my house." hold in order. I need to figure out the will. I need to make sure my cultural responsibilities are are done dutifully and and all of these things, right? Because in all likelihood, his dad hadn't died yet. He was just worried about getting everything in order. But Jesus says, no, you have a different responsibility. Your duty, he says, is to go and preach the kingdom. So come and follow me. See, following Jesus can't have any conditions can't have any conditions. And it doesn't mean that this was a sinful request. It doesn't mean that it was a bad request. In fact, Jesus is asking some of you in our church right now to take care of your parents during this season. And that is a good and a godly call. But what happens when Jesus calls you to something different? What happens when Jesus asks you to go on an adventure that that throws you for a loop or feels like a curveball? Do you slap a condition on it? Or will you follow him with full Obedience, you know, sometimes I think we put a timetable on obedience to Jesus. And oftentimes he's just asking us with faith to follow him. That but yet phrase, that is a that is just a brutal phrase. I'll follow you, Jesus, but but first let me finish my degree. I'll share my faith, but first let me get all the right answers. I'll I'll start giving, but first let me get a little bit more out of debt or get a promotion so I have more money and it's over and over and over again but first but first but first we always put these conditions on following him and i just have to say that we just need to step out in faith the butts of christianity they just have to go right like this isn't this isn't going to be helpful in our discipleship butts and obedience they just never work well together that's more language like a fan than it is a follower And something that I've noticed in the last five to 10 years of Christian ministry is that somehow spiritual procrastination, but spiritual procrastination is not a godly attribute. And we need to make sure we're not putting any conditions or any timetables on us following Jesus. That word wasn't hard enough. Jesus draws another line in the sand in the third interaction. He just keeps piling it on. Our first interaction or excuse me, in our last interaction from this scripture, we learn that following Jesus requires dedication. It requires dedication. First it was comfort, then it was conditions. Now it's dedication. I'm gonna read verse. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. If you notice, it's it's another but first response. And not a, not a crazy request, right? But Jesus kind of answers it in a dramatic kind of way. He could have simply said no or, or make it quick or, hey, yeah, that's all fine, but we leave tomorrow. But instead, Jesus uses a word picture 
and some really strong language. He said, whoever puts his hand to the plow and turns back isn't fit for the kingdom of God. These are strong words and very interesting response from Jesus. And, and quite honestly, this word picture probably doesn't land on our modern culture some 2,000 years later very well because most of us aren't working in a field on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want to give you a, a modern translation. I want, I want you to remember, though, that G Jesus is really, he's really speaking with provocative language. He's trying to draw a point. And emphasize something in a dramatic way. So, so let me modernize what this actually meant. This is maybe how Jesus, so I'm not saying this is exactly how Jesus would say it today, but this is a lot more like Jesus would say it today. Hey, if you're driving south on I-25 at 100 miles per hour, you would better keep your eyes fixed on the road ahead of you. Because behind you, you better believe there's going to be an accident. There's going to be a crash. You need to keep your eyes fixed on the prize ahead of you. If you imagine your life drawn out like a giant field, multiple football fields in a row, and if you if you mowing that field, even if you start just a little bit off kilter, by the time that discipleship journey carries out year after year after year, you're going to be very far off pace. See, Jesus is drawing a line in the sand. He said, you can't put your hand to the plow and turn back because that plow that following him that requires full dedication. An all-in attitude and one where you don't get distracted by, by what's off to your left or what's off to your right or what's behind you, but instead you just stay focused on Jesus. And of course, we all have ups and downs. We all have good times and hard times. We all have moments of spiritual ecstasy and spiritual deserts, right? Jesus is saying, will you continue to move forward? He's not talking about the, the natural rhythms and the ebbs of flows, the ebb, the ebb and flow of our, of our mistakes or, or even when we sin and walk away. He's talking about this full-on dedication of our heart. He's talking about this spiritual truth, about what it means to be a wholehearted disciple. And one of the interesting things for me in this text is that Jesus doesn't seem anxious about how people will respond. He doesn't seem bothered or anything like that. He, he's quite differentiated from the crowd, actually. He just says, hey, if you want to follow me, this is what it's like. Will you follow me even if it gets uncomfortable? Will you follow me with no conditions attached to it? Will you follow me with a, with a whole heart, full dedication for what I'm inviting you into? I want to close this morning with a story and then a question. About seven or eight years ago, I was between ministry jobs. I was working in sales. And if you've been in the vineyard for any length of time, you know that I loved that job. I loved the hustle. I loved being in homes. Uh, selling to different homeowners. I loved selling a great product that had incredible integrity. And, and it was a financial blessing for us as a family. You know, we were young. We had two kids. Uh, we had a lot of medical debt. We had college debt. We had like, job was, was a gift. It was a financial blessing to us. And at the time, I was actually working on a sale that would have been a, a corporate record. I was 100% commissions too, so this would have been literally a life-changing sale. I don't say that with hyperbole. It would have been a life-changing sale for us. But God started to speak to us about leaving that job. He started to speak to me about going back into full-time ministry, and, and there, was a, there was a job opportunity that popped up. And God began to speak to us about taking that job opportunity. And, and actually, to be completely honest, that Calling it a job opportunity is a bit of an exaggeration. It was an unpaid internship. And we just felt like God was telling us to go, to leave this high paying job where we were in ship. And it was in Maine of all places. I mean, Maine is beautiful in the fall, but it is horribly cold and dark like all of the time in the winter. God was asking us to give up everything and to go out there didn't make sense. I mean, we were in our upper 20s, two kids, and I was going to quit this job and move out and live in some stranger's basement for a few months with my family so we could do this unpaid internship. We ended up getting a little bit of a stipend, but that hardly paid for our groceries. I mean, this was a bizarre thing to go and do, but we knew that God was asking us to do it. So I ended up calling my sales manager and I told him I needed to resign as soon as possible because God was calling us in a different direction. 
I told him, we feel called to move. The sales manager said, I will give you $30,000 to stay. And you don't even have to stay forever. Like I realize you're resigning. Just stay to the end of the year. Take the internship in January, starting next year. I'll give you 30,000 to stay. Plus you'll get commission on every other job that you work and you might even close that record breaking sale. 30 grand to stay put for just a few more months. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a big bonus. That, that is a bonus. That And I just had this little piece in my heart. I would say 99% of my heart knew I couldn't take the money that I needed to resign anyway. But when you hear $30,000 bonus, I, at least part of my heart was like, God, is this a test or is this a gift? Like which one, which one is this? But I knew that I needed to reject it. So I just told him, hey, this very generous offer, but I have to resign. I, I, I can't take the money. And he said, hey, look, Jeff, you're a praying man. Just pray about it for 24 hours. And so I did. I, I said I'd pray about it for 24 hours and I'd call him back the next day. I hang up my phone. And immediately when I hang out the phone, I hear the Lord say this verse, Luke 9, 62. In that moment, I just felt the presence of God and I just knew that without a doubt, I needed to obey him and I needed to obey him in that moment. No comfort, no conditions, full dedication. I picked up the phone. I called my sales manager back and said, Hey, I don't need 24 hours. I know what I need to do. I'm going to leave the money on the table and I'm going to relocate my family to Maine to take this internship. He thought I was crazy. Our families thought we were crazy. <laughs> I think even our Sandy and church thought we were a little bit crazy, but we knew in our heart of hearts that this is what God was asking us to do. And I realized that my story is not your story. Right? That we have different personalities, we have different callings, we have different responsibilities in the kingdom of God. I'm not trying to make my story your story, but I think we are all united behind Jesus. We're all part of the same body of Christ and we're all leaning into this message, asking God, what does it mean to follow you? What does it mean to grow and expand your kingdom? For me, in, in that particular moment of my life, it was letting go of money and it was following him. And it's not always money. Sometimes it's other things. It might be money for you right now, but it might not be. It might be a bad relationship. It might be a toxic relationship that's keeping you from a wholehearted, uh, being a wholehearted disciple of Jesus. I don't know what it is for you. But I think it's worth asking the question, what is keeping me from following Jesus with my whole heart? What's getting in the way? Is it comfort? Is it Conditions? Do I have a yeah, but in my relationship with Jesus? Or is it a lack of focus and dedication? Are you a fan of Jesus or are you a true follower of Christ? The scripture is a beautiful picture, but I want to remind you as I wrap up that the very next text is Jesus commissioning 70 disciples to go out and participate in the most spirit, beautifully spiritual, adventurous thing they've ever done. They were commissioned to go preach the gospel, see the healings, set the oppressed free, and be part of growing God's kingdom. And I can't help but wonder how many followers, how many people listening to Jesus during this, back, during this passage never got to be part of the 70. They had been following Jesus. They have been walking around, listening to all of his words, but they were only fans. And when Jesus drew these lines in the sand, they said, no, that's not for me. And Jesus looks at the rest of the crowd, picks out 70, and sends them on the way. I don't know about you, but I want to be counted in the 70. I don't want to put any conditions on following him. I want to be part of the 70 that gets commissioned to go and do great things for Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your presence here with us. Would you come and continue to speak to us? Continue to move. Would you agitate our hearts in the most holy and loving way that you can? And would you invite us deeper still? In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I would say, as we move into our time of reflection and response, we're just gonna kind of merge these times together. Natalie's gonna play a little bit. We'll have a a quiet moment, and then we'll move into a time of ministry and prayer.
But I want to say, if you want prayer, click that live prayer button. Our staff will be ready to pray with you this morning. If you're ready to give as an act of worship, we encourage you to give online this morning, to remember our local church this morning as an act of worship. Of course, you can worship with us as well. We would love for you to sing and just have houses all over Northern Colorado worshiping in your heart than Jesus. It will eventually hold you back from Jesus. So if you have anything in your life that you hold closer than Christ, it will eventually hold you back from being part of that 70. And those are the things that we want to invite God to do business with us about this morning so we can eliminate all those things from our life and fix our eyes on Him.
gather, that we could worship, Lord. I pray that you would fill us with all that we need for our day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Vineyard Church, thanks for hanging with us. It probably felt like you were hanging with us uh, to a degree as, as our internet is here with us and apart and I don't know how many times you had to hit the refresh button to to stay with us this morning but we glad we're, we're happy and we're glad that you you at least gave it a good college try and, <laughs> and hung out with us a little bit this morning we love you and we are so excited to gather together next Sunday as we continue this series crazy things Jesus said I'll I'll be stepping us into the third kind of pillar of this series the pillar of live and so we're excited to be doing that next Sunday and excited to see you all then. God bless you and have a great rest of your Sunday. Bye. Take care.